Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, I am going to share a couple of observations with you which are every bit as humorous as the cat video from Grayson County or the, uh, the horny deer horns from North Korea. <laughs> um, audit. Um, first of all, I just want to share with you once again uh, the path that we've traveled the last couple of days. And I, and I want to thank all of the budget conferees for the efforts that they have made up to this point. Uh, when we get into budget conference, there really are not Republicans and Democrats when we work on the budget that regardless of our personal persuasions, we defend the position of the Senate. Uh, and that doesn't carry forward when we get on the floor, but I want to thank all of the budget conferees for your personal integrity and commitment to that. But I would say we started, um, while we have been working hard on the budget and are remain willing uh, to continue to work towards a resolution with our friends down the House, I'd like to remind you we started a couple of days ago uh, with those resolutions to extend. And as I commented earlier this morning, there were some justifiable reasons not to do that. But we started that. During that period of time, the House did not even begin to address trying to get into a posture where we could address the budget impasse. Uh, this morning, we passed the resolution 248 that called for a special session of the General Assembly requesting His Excellency the Governor to call the special session. When we passed that uh, without dissent in this body, and I was very pleased about the unanimity uh, that we demonstrated on that in calling for the special session, I immediately requested the clerk's office to physically deliver that resolution down to the House of Delegates. And up to that point, they had made no effort to try and get us into a special session or to extend the session. When they received that, they reacted in a very humorous manner. First of all, I was advised, we will not take up your resolution. And I said, wow. I tried to chuckle. I mean, they call me Senator Cream Puff for a reason. <laughs> well, there are auditory issues here on occasions, but we won't go there. Um, and I, I said, really? Um, and shortly thereafter, I was advised that they were going to take up a resolution calling upon the governor to call for a special session. And not only did they do that after we had delivered our resolution, they issued for immediate release, a press release on it. And I read the press release, and one of the lines in it is the House budget includes a plan to work with the Trump administration. And what immediately came to my mind is they also are engaging in fake news down the hall. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I, I read was about the Senate budget includes a plan to expand the current Medicaid program, they're talking about in our budget, at a cost of $440 million with no funding to pay for it. And I, I almost broke out in hysterics. It was so funny because it was so erroneous. And in a moment, the senator from Bedford is going to share with you some remarks on that. So I reflected back, you know, here we've been trying like the Dickens to get us in a posture to continue to discuss and negotiate a budget, which is our primary responsibility. 
And then I see what happens today as soon as we try to take the leadership with some unanimity, they react and send out a trashy piece of a news release that is completely distorting what we are trying to do. And I scratch my head and I say, why are they doing this? And a couple of, I won't say it was an epiphany because I was raised as a Southern Baptist and we don't use those kind of terms, but I did at least have a moment of lucidity. And it occurred to me a couple of things are going on. Uh, my local newspaper wrote an article a year or so ago and said I had the dubious pleasure of being the majority leader and the minority leader of the Senate more than anybody in the history of Virginia. And my dear friend, Senator Sasslaw, has also enjoyed that opportunity. But the real point of it is we have gone through a cultural change in this body for many years where it has been 19, 21, 21, 19, 20, 20. And in spite of our ideological differences, most of the time we get along pretty collegiate and we do not engage in initiating fake news and attacks. I do think that the House of Delegates are still waiting for that moment of lucidity and epiphany to realize that their margin is 51 to 49. And my good friend, Senator Sasslaw, will tell you that when you have a one vote margin, regardless of whether it's Republicans or Democrats, it takes an entirely different skill set to lead your caucus and to lead a body. And one of the words that ought to be retched, etched right across your forehead is compromise and developing consensus. And those consensus are not always restricted to your party. And I don't think that our friends down the hall who lost 15 seats have adjusted just yet to that cultural resolution, that, that cultural realization. And what has come about, I think, is a divisiveness within that majority party down there. And I have told our ladies and gentlemen on this side that if I as the pretending leader of the Senate Republicans was put in a position where I was out on an issue by myself and my entire leadership team was the other way on that uh, same position, I would resign because it would, yeah, I know you'd be happy over there, um, <laughs> but it would be an unequivocal demonstration that I was not providing the leadership that was consistent with the majority of where my caucus wanted to go. And if you look down there on the House budget, which is completely constructed on Medicaid expansion savings that they did not spend on health care, you would see that there is a significant division within that caucus because the majority of their caucus voted against their own budget and all but one of their leadership team voted against that budget. And I won't say that that is a reflection of a meltdown, but it is certainly a reflection that there's at least some modest chaos going down the hall. And I find that with some degree of amusement, but I also find it with some degree of irritation as I hear, we're not going to take up your resolution because we want to do it. I take it with some irritation where both Republican and Senate House bills, I mean Republican and Democratic bills, have died down the hall recently without getting a hearing. And it happened on both sides. Let there be no mistake. And I get an apology. And then within 24 hours, when we're trying to exchange conference committee reports, 
without any advance notice, they decide to recess for multiple hours while we are sitting here trying to get work done and don't even have the courtesy of telling us. And the apology is, ah, gosh, we're sorry. It was a miscommunication. And then this morning we come in and I am trying to collectively move us to a posture where we can start talking about the budget and we take the leadership role on the Senate and send a resolution down there and I am immediately told we're not taking it up. So, Mr. President, yes, I am modestly annoyed, which happens very rarely with Senator Cream Puff, but I really am. It, it, it is not the way that a deliberative legislative body should run. We can have our political differences. We can have our policy differences. But this is something else. So I just say to you, Mr. President, I thank all 39 other members of the Senate that we have been able to provide some leadership in honestly working towards a resolution of this impasse on the budget. I thank you for our collective support in getting a resolution to have His Excellency call us in to a special session. And I think that we have operated within this body in spite of our partisanship with dignity and comedy. But you know what? It's turning into a comedy down there. And for that, it's just creating a modest annoyance. And but so I don't get further annoyed and lathered up, Mr. President, as someone might if I was like Senator Servell and a real trial lawyer, which I am not. Um, I will yield to uh, my seatmate, the Senator from Bedford, who might want to share some factual information with you on this unfunded $440 million. Senator from Bedford.